Heavenly Father, again, Lord, you have granted us another most excellent Sabbath day. And we ask your presence, your Holy Spirit, your angels are here. And like gatherings throughout the world, Lord, that we may keep your Sabbath holy and that we may do your will, not ours. Be with us as we study and worship. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. We're going back to Hebrews 8. I want to conclude there and then move on. And we've been looking at the menorah or the candlestick, however, whatever you want to call it, the candle holder that's in the sanctuary, and how Jesus made great reference to it. However, most people don't know that because the components of the menorah have never really been looked at. And when Jesus said certain things, he used the words that make up the components. He had to because they're the same words. For instance, yoke, <laughs> you know, uh, is part of it. Farming, planting is part of the menorah. What kind of occupation were these people? What was their occupations? What did they do? One of two things. They were either fishermen or farmers. The majority of them were farmers. There weren't that many fishermen, and I'll bet you the fishermen had farms. Because how did they eat? They didn't eat fish all the time. Guarantee you they had a garden. So the components that make up the menorah are uh, primarily farm expressions. Buds, blossoms, almonds, plowing the ground, yoke. <laughs> Did Jesus ever mention a yoke? Well, the word for yoke is the root word for menorah. And what's the menorah made out of? Gold. Gold, which is what? Who? The law. The, it's it's uh, 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 divinity. It's entity, it's God, it's Jesus, it's the character, it's the law. It's solid gold, one of the few pieces of furniture in the sanctuary that actually is solid gold. So, Jesus said about the yoke, then he? he made a comment about his yoke. Yes, we're going to look at that. Also, what was the function of the menorah in the sanctuary, or the candlestick if you don't like that word? What was its function? What was its purpose? To give off light. To hold the candles. To hold the candles that reflect the light. Did Jesus make reference to that at any time? Did he not say, let your light shine? Your light shine. Now the word for menorah <laughs> or for the light had to do with plowing the earth. You see? So to let your light shine what are you doing? Turning over new ground. Giving new light, you see. And the menorah, the candlestick, was against the wall. And as the priest lit the flame, what happened in the sanctuary? It reflected off the wall. And illuminated. And the wall was just any old thing, right, David? No, the wall was gold. Gold. It was wood, acacia wood, special wood that had special qualities, that would represented whose human character? Christ, the acacia. And, and Moses was specifically told to use acacia wood because they had the properties that Jesus had as a human being that we should have. It didn't rot. It couldn't be attacked by disease. It gave off a, a special fragrance, not an odor, a fragrance. And I've smelled acacia. And it's very prominent, very prominent. It was uh, uh, drought resistant, very tolerant, grew in the desert. <laughs> so, and then it was overlaid with gold. Whose character was that? Christ. Christ, God's character, the law, however you want to look at it, divinity. And the light was lit and it reflected off that gold and it illuminated the sanctuary. Correct? 
Correct. So it's a very important piece of furniture. And Jesus said, let your light shine. How did the light get lit in the sanctuary? Was it, you just took out your Bic lighter and lit it? No, the light from uh, up on Mount Sinai, the uh, fire from Mount Sinai was carried. Well, it was God's fire that lit it, wasn't it? Did something happen in the tabernacle? That somebody didn't use the divine fire? What happened? They were... Aaron's sons. They went in and they took out and they went boom and they... Right in front of everybody. Drop dead, stone dead. Because they used strange fire. Not the fire from God. And God's fire does not consume when it is of the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? It enlightens. Was there an an incident that took place in the Bible where something was on fire but didn't burn? The bush. The bush up didn't Moses there. see a burning bush? And what caught his attention? It wasn't unusual to see a burning bush because you get a lightning strike. We all live in Florida, don't we? Do things just kind of catch on fire down here from time to time? Yes. Yeah. But what caught Moses' eye about this particular bush? The bush wasn't, wasn't, it wasn't consumed, consumed by the fire. You see? And... What did, when he came near the bush, what did the bush say to him? The bush didn't speak, but Jesus spoke to him. What did he say? Take Ta off your thy shoes, you are on holy ground. You're on holy ground. So the menorah, the fire that comes from God, is on holy ground, isn't it? Yes. You see? So we need to understand this. Anyhow, back, and, and this all has to do with Jesus' ministry. He's the high priest. He's in charge of the church, not men. He commands the Holy Spirit, not men. Anyhow, uh, Hebrews 8 here is talking about Christ's ministry, and it was talking about the Old and the New Covenant, and it was talking about the problems with the Old Covenant. Not that there was a problem with the Covenant. Where was the problem? With the men. With the ministration of it. That's why Jesus took it in his own hands, and he took it to a tabernacle or a temple that was not built by men, but built by whom? Exactly. So, he's in charge of it. And his new covenant is, and I, I want to read this, and then I want to go down to some commentary, and then I want to move on to these other verses, just talking about each particular component of the menorah. And we're going to watch and look through the New Testament how Jesus and the apostles applied these things and the words they used. And that's exactly what they were talking about. And I always point over there because that's where it was in <laughs> the tabernacle. Anyhow, um, verse 10 of Hebrews 8. Paul says here, For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their heart, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Was that something new? No. Where did Paul borrow that from? Jeremiah. <laughs> so... There wasn't anything really new about it other than the concept of we don't have to go through a priest. That was the problem. You see, that was the, that's the problem with religion today. That's why we're here now. When I mean here, I mean here in this building and not sitting down in some conference. Larry told me on the way up that in his church that he goes to in Cleveland, they brought in a Sabbath school teacher from the conference. Do you know what the conference Sabbath school teacher told the people? Or I don't know if it was him or the preacher. The, the Sabbath school teacher told that anybody over 50 should not be teaching Sabbath school. And also said that this is the last generation of Ellen White. Oh, that's true about Ellen White. Do you believe that? This is very probably the last generation this planet's going to see. Do you believe that? Yes. The man was speaking truth about that. However, nobody over 50 should be teaching. Puts me out. I guess I'll go home. Why do you suppose they're saying that, folks? Dennis. 
What, 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 for, the, for the tape, we need Because to. the younger generation doesn't read um, Ellen White's writing or doesn't believe in it. Larry well, made a good observation. He said because basically people under 50 don't know about Seventh-day Adventism. They know Adventism, but they don't know what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist. And they want to keep it that way because they're pointing everything to what kind of Adventist? Sunday. First day. First day. I find it interesting that the Protestant churches choose to celebrate Easter and Christmas when that is strictly a Roman Catholic holiday. That's where it came from. When Jesus walked the earth, do you realize they were keeping Easter? You know where egg, Larry and I are talking, you know where egg roll, I don't want to get off on another subject, but it's apropos here because we're talking about the ministration of salvation. Do you know where egg rolling came from? Does anybody know? Uh, well, go ahead, David. Well, yesterday I heard out of it, it was supposed to be, they colored it red because it was supposedly uh, drops of Christ's blood in, in one country. Well, it's all pagan, it's fertility. Well, there's a specific event that happened in, 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 in the ancients. And when Nimrod had died, his wife said that he went up to the sun. And he was ruling from the sun. Now remember, who started sun worship again after the flood? Nimrod. Nimrod. Ham was his great-grandfather who built, and then it went down from Nimrod. There shouldn't have been any ham in the ark, you see. That was a courtesy to Noah. That was also an object lesson. This time around, you're not getting in the ark if you're not 100% on Christ's side. Anyhow, Nimrod died. He went, he became part of the sun, the sun, however it goes, I don't know. But anyhow, he was up there at the sun. And he was a great builder, Nimrod. He was a great hunter. He was a great builder. He was a, he was a very powerful man. There is no doubt about it. And when she said when he wanted a new city, he'd drop an egg out of the sky, roll it down the river, and because the city's of that empire were along the river. Remember Nineveh? That was one of their cities. Remember Jonah didn't want to go because it was a really Christian place and they didn't need him. Is that the way the story went? <laughs> no, he kept getting stoned and beaten and beaten every time. It was an extremely pagan place. And he said, God, just burn them all. They don't need me. Anyhow, Nimrod would drop an egg out of the sky, it would roll down a river, and where it broke, they were to build a city. That's where egg rolling comes from. How about hot cross buns? You know where they come from? On the sunrise of Eshtar, Easter, they would take and bake little cakes, breads, whatever you want to call them, and they'd go up on the mountaintops, and they would hold them in their hands to the sun who was their king, Nimrod, and as the sun came up, say if it wasn't cloudy out, the rays of the sun would cross. You know when the sun comes up, you get the, those golden rays emanate from it, which actually has to do with the sanctuary. Uh, would, would come across the tops of the buns, and that meant that the god of the sun accepted their food offering. That's what sunrise service is all about. So why are Protestant churches setting chairs up to the east to come tomorrow morning and have sunrise service? See, because when Jesus was alive, they were doing that. Because where do you find all this information, by the way? In the New or the Old Testament? You've got to go back to the Old Testament. It's been around for thousands of years. Eshtar, Easter. So the ministers of Protestantism want to keep their pews filled, so what do they do? Well, we're going to do this because it's fun. And it was. What kid doesn't like coloring Easter eggs? What kid doesn't like chocolate or marshmallow bunnies that you can bite the heads off of? You see? But folks, this is the ministration of the gospel. Is it right? Should a Christian partake of such an event that celebrates sun worship? Where was the door of the tabernacle? Which direction? West. Why? So, so they wouldn't be watching, looking at the sun going in. When they went out for morning service, where was the sun? To their back. To their back. Where are the Protestant churches setting their chairs up now? Which way are they facing? To the east. 
What does it say back there in the book of Ezekiel about those who mourn and wail for who? Tammuz. That's Easter worship. And it's an abomination unto the Lord. But yet, our ministers, and I've sat in Seventh-day Adventist churches that had Easter programs on Sabbath. Have you? I have. Now, they're out in the open doing sunrise Sunday services. They advertise them in the Boltons now. Last generation of Ellen White? Oh, yes. If you want to know how soon the Lord's coming back, don't look in the world, because the world's a mess. Look inside his remnant church. You will know how soon. By the events that are the depth of apostasy we are in. We're on the borders of the promised land, and we've gone a-whoring with the heathen women. Do you believe that? And very soon, Phineas is going to drive a spear through the prince. And that's going to be the end of it. The plagues are going to fall. You know what I'm talking about, correct? Yeah. This is the ministration of the gospel, folks. Heathen fertility rituals. Now, how do you take those young girls and put them out in that environment? What do you suppose is going to happen? They're taught that this is a good way of life. They're taught that bunny rabbits and eggs are good. What do they represent? Fertility. It's a perpetual sexual ritual. And this is what we put before our young people, and we wonder why we have teen, pre teen 10, 12-year-old pregnant girls running around. It's in our music. It's in our gospel message, because if you're doing Easter and Christmas services, that's what that's all about, you see. It's celebrated in Fat Tuesday and Mardi Gras. What do you think Mardi Gras? That's a very high Catholic service. Are you aware of that? That Fat Tuesday is a very sacred, one of the most sacred Catholic rituals there is, and it takes place in the United States and New Orleans. Very sacred. But this is fun and pleasure. And what takes place at Mardi Gras? Is it a nice place for a Christian to be? <laughs> we have a perpetual month of it in Orlando, don't we? Anyhow, this is the ministration of the gospel, folks. This is what we're talking about. Is that letting your light shine? Is that bringing people to Jesus or bringing people to Barabbas. Do you know what Barabbas means? At Jesus' let's talk about Easter so-called. At Jesus' trial, a man was held up named Barabbas. And Jesus, do you know what Barabbas means? The son of the father. Bar Abbas. Abba, the father. Bar Joseph, son of Joseph. So what was actually taking place is the government was holding up, the government being Rome, and was holding up an imposter who claimed to be the son of the father, symbolically, and the real, and who did the church pick? Wow. Wow. Now, was the imposter a good upstanding man? Or was he a murderer? And a thief? What's the devil? What does the Bible call him? A liar, a murderer, a thief? But who is coming as Antichrist? Well, the Antichrist is here. What I mean is to impersonate Jesus. So I take that back about that word Antichrist. That was wrong. Who's coming to impersonate Jesus? Barabbas. And who are the people going to choose? Barabbas. And what are they going to do to the faithful Seventh-day Adventists at that point? Away with them. Crucify them. That's right, chapter, whatever. However, we have a promise, don't we, at that point? We have a promise. It's not going to happen again, is it? At that point, destiny is sealed, isn't it? When they choose the false in place of the real, 
There's not going to be another go around. There's not going to be another 2,000 years, is there? It's done. Jesus comes out of the sanctuary. This is the ministration of the gospel, folks. This is the truth. It happened once. It was an object lesson. They held a government, the church. They held up this imposter who was a murderer and a thief. And instead, they crucified who? God. The gospel. The law. The truth. And then they perpetuated. They, they took all these rituals and they combined them under the direction of the rabbis and the, and, and, and the, the Sanhedrin. Did you know that? Do you know where the Roman pontiff got all his information from? <laughs> from the Jews that escaped. From the Jews that left Jerusalem and went to Alexandria. And they were scribes, lawyers, and Pharisees. They made their way to Rome, and they hooked up with the pagan leader, and guess what they came up with? A hybrid of Christianity. The devil knows what he's doing to deceive. Because today, the Roman Catholic Church is nothing more than the Jewish first century church reborn. And I've said that time and time again. You've got a high priest who rules. You've got a city that he rules from. You've got a council, a high council, that rules the people. Pomp, ceremony, dress. His word is law. Period. Infallible. D does that ring any bells? <laughs> People afraid. And they also have a hit squad, don't they? Did the first century church have one? Who was in charge of it for a time? Who was in charge of their Paul. Jesuit order? Paul. The apostle Paul, when he was Saul, was sent out to do what? Kill. In prison, kill, and torture. Was there an inquisition under the Roman Catholic Church? Yep. Was Paul running an inquisition when he was Saul? Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's the same thing, just in a different wrapper. And it's going to do the same thing that that church did. It's going to couple its power up with civil authorities, and then it's going to go after the true believers with civil power. Do we see that happening? Interesting. Anyhow, so this... Uh, verse 10 of Romans 8. The covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, the days of what? What are the after those days? What did Paul say was a shadow of things to come? After Christ's crucifixion, the ultimate sacrifice. After those days. I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. Does it say there I will change my laws so they can keep Sunday? Does it say that there? Does it say that I'm going to make it so that the sinner can go to heaven? Is that what it says? No. What laws will he put in there? And who is he? What laws? They're the only one that exists, right, Dennis? And who is the I? That is speaking here. Christ. God. What did Jesus say? If you love me... Keep my commandments. But that's not the whole statement. As I have kept whose commandments? My Father's. So you cannot say this is a new set of commandments. That's right there in, in John 17, isn't it? John 14, 15, 16, and 17. It says, Paul says... And, and what's amazing to me is the Protestant world points to Paul as the one who said it's okay to break God's law. But he's quoting Jeremiah, isn't he? I will put, this is the covenant, and I want to get on to reading about the covenant, because I'm taking, well, that's okay. I will put my law into their mind and write them in their hearts. Now, when God wrote his law, did he write it on wood? No. Did he write it on paper? No. Nope. Well, some was. However, his law, the gold in the sanctuary, the gold that's here, the gold that's here that we rest upon as the 12 tribes, as each individual is represented here, the gold that the mercy seat's made out of. What law is that? Ten Commandments. When he wrote his law for us here on earth, what did he write it in? Stone. What does that mean? 
forever. Do we still have, even in contracts, when it says it's written in stone, does that mean it can be changed? Okay. Unchangeable. God says, I, the Lord thy God, do not change, it says back there in Malachi. I will not alter the thing that has gone out of my mouth, it says. I will do nothing unless it goes through my prophet first. We're warned, you see. Anyhow, I will write them in their mind and their heart, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Don't believe that Easter garbage. Don't believe that Christmas garbage. Don't believe that garbage that your name needs to be on somebody's books here on earth to have salvation. That's not what it says. Don't believe that you can't be more than, well, it, it, when you hit 49 and 3 quarters, you better hand your teachers quarterly in because you ain't teaching the next quarter. <laughs> don't believe that. Don't believe that if you don't have a PhD or a thing with, you can't be one of God's people because we're to aspire to a royal, holy priesthood. Isn't that what it says? In how many places in the Bible can you think of off the top of your head? How about in Exodus, and how about in Peter? A royal, holy priesthood. Does a priesthood sit on there behind? There's the garments of Christ's priests. Not with this. Not with the ephod. However, these are the garments. Christ, and they represent his righteousness, his sacrifice, his salvation, to go out and warn the world, to let our light shine. You see, we don't manufacture a light. That's, when you manufacture a light, that's every man teaching his neighbor. Jesus said, you worship me in vain because for doctrine you're teaching your own commandments. Now, did he say that to the Catholics? Or did he say that to the Seventh-day Adventists? So-called. Seventh-day Adventists. Yeah. And then he goes on to say, verse 12, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities. I will remember no more. In that he says, A new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. All those rules and regulations. All those man-made laws. What's going to happen to them when he appears? And Jesus appears when we accept him. Not at some event in the future. Jesus said, follow me now. Let the dead bury the dead. Salvation is now. So when he appears... See, because Paul was talking about when Jesus appeared, all, uh, remember John the Baptist said what? I must decrease, he must increase. John the Baptist was a bona fide Seventh-day Adventist minister. He had the right to be the high priest because that's what his father was. And he said, I must decrease, he must increase. That's when Jesus appeared. Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. You see? So rules and regulations will get us in trouble when they're not according to God. Matter of fact, they'll kill us. They'll throw us in a lake of fire. Anyhow, I want to read some uh, commentary here, and then uh, if we have time, move on to some of these items that I want to break down from the menorah uh, to the different... Nah, anyhow, she says down here, if you have a Seventh-day Adventist Bible, which I'm proud of, under verses 6 through 7. God's people are justified through the administration of the better covenant. Through Christ's righteousness. A covenant is an agreement by which parties bind themselves and each other is to the fulfillment of of a certain condition. Did you comprehend what that means? Can a contract be only on one side? 
right here, the Bible is clearly saying that the covenant I will make with them is they will put their, my laws, he being his laws, in their mind and in their heart. What does that infer on the other side? What, Dennis? Here. It infers that the, the person saying that he's keeping the law. Exactly. And then the covenant goes, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a people and then they shall, uh, uh, I will be to them a God and then they shall be to me a people. What's the inference there? You have to keep the covenant. Now, if you go out and buy a brand new car, car of your dreams, I just had a friend buy a 500 Mercedes. He's been saving all his life to buy it. He paid cash for it. He didn't finance it. That's why we say he put 300,000 miles on his, on his van. But anyhow, if he had financed that vehicle, did he enter into a covenant with the Mercedes-Benz Corporation? Now, could he just take that car, drive it away, and never say anything to them again? What's the part of his covenant? You can drive the car so long as... Is God any different? And then there's another problem. The state of Florida, he happens to live in New Jersey. The state of New Jersey says, Okay, Sal, you have a nice new shiny car. You can drive it so long as... You register and insure the vehicle. Now, if he drives it without doing that, what will the state of New Jersey do? Ooh, he's going to go to jail. He's going to lose his driver's license. They may even impound his vehicle, which they will. Up there, you get caught driving without insurance. They take your car. They tow it. You see? So why is God any different? We want to honor, or man wants us to honor their covenants, but yet the ministration of the gospel says you don't have to honor God's, but we're going to give you salvation anyway. Ooh. How about if I go buy a brand new whatever, and the salesman says, oh, just put the down payment down and go out the door. You can have it anyway. And I say, ooh, okay, aren't we experiencing a lot of that right now in our economy, folks? Does it work? What do you think the problem is? Not honoring the covenants. There's recompense. God did not change his law. Man did. See the problem? That's why Jesus Christ right now is wearing those clothes that costume, and he's standing before the throne of God so that we can be righteous, justified, and sanctified, provided we do what? See this white robe right here? We have to put it on. And what does that represent? My righteousness? His man's righteousness? Who's wearing it? Christ. Christ's righteousness. Nothing I can do. However, there's a covenant. There's a contract. God's no fool. He didn't send his son to die so I can sin. Does that make sense? Mercedes didn't build that car so Sal didn't have to pay for it. He had to pay for that car. That's the deal. And if you get a third party involved, you're going to have to pay their interest. You see? But there is no third party here. Jesus eliminated that. You see? That's the better covenant. Because we're not faithful enough. Anyhow, she goes on to say, <clears throat> the fulfillment of certain conditions. Thus the human agent enters into an agreement with God to comply with the conditions specified in his word. There should be no doubt of what Jesus requires of us. Paul simply says he's our example in all things. Isn't that what, isn't that what the Bible says? He's our example. Let your light shine. Whose light is it? It's God's light given to us, taught to us through Christ and ministered by the Holy Spirit that needs to dwell right here. This is the temple. Not some building, not some organization. How did Jesus say in his prayer in John 17 that 
we, what, what truth is and how we were to be sanctified. What did Jesus say? Thy Father sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is truth. What is he talking about? What word? The Pope's word? The General Conference President's word? The local preacher's word? Thy word. In the beginning was the word, and the word became flesh. And remember, we looked at that word, word, what it actually means. It means God, simply put. When you break it down from the Greek and the Hebrew. And you say, oh, well, that's in the New Testament, that's Greek. But what was Matthew, or John? He was a Jew. So you have to look at the Hebrew too, don't you? Because that's where his knowledge is coming from. He spoke it first, then it got translated into the Greek. He wrote it in Hebrew. It's important to understand that. A lot of translation is lost that way. Anyhow, <clears throat> through God's word, he, we're to know what the contract says. He expects that of us. So what does that infer? We have to study it. Who's the teacher? Jesus said, what was the Holy Spirit's job? Don't forget. To teach. To lead us into all these things. And it says here in this new covenant, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor. Why? Because that priest was replaced by who? The Holy Spirit. <laughs> I love it when I talk to people. I have to go see what my pastor says about that. Do you know what my answer is to him? Why don't you see what the Bible has to say about it? Because your pastor is only going to lead you in the way he wants you to believe. Or your preacher. He's, not going, to, he's going to lead you in that franchise's belief. Because that's what religions are. Franchises. They were in Jesus' day because they were changing money, weren't they? <laughs> they were taking your money and giving you their money. And then selling you something. That's a franchise. And in order to do that in the synagogues, they had to have the stamp of approval from the Sanhedrin that's a franchise, folks. Today, it's the same way. We just had a trial not too long ago in Miami that clearly said that the Seventh-day Adventist name is what? It's a business. It's a franchise. Our prophet tells us we would out-Jew the Jews. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful. There are no givens other than what's found in the scripture, other than what's found on the clothing that the high priest wears, which has everything to do with our salvation and our character. Anyhow, his conduct shows whether or not he respects these conditions. Let your light shine. The conduct of the contract signer or agreer, how you perform determines whether you accept Christ. Do you believe that? Can you go out and carry on and listen to and do whatever and eat whatever and live however you want and then say, I love Jesus? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, Jesus said. Flies right in the... Well, you may love the church you go to, but that doesn't mean you love Jesus. Because they don't know who they're serving. Because remember what happened back here in 1844 when Jesus got up and went into the holy place. Who took over his throne? Ooh. Did the people know it? Well, that has to do with the menorah, too, because remember, the almond shape means to watch, to be awake, to be alert, you see? Anyhow, she goes on to say, man gains everything by obeying the covenant-keeping God. God's attributes, now listen to this, are imparted to man. Whose attributes? Wow. In the beginning, God created man. And he said, let us. Who's the us? Who's the plural? Father, Son, and Spirit. Make man in our own image. Plural again. In other words, God fully intended that this creation should have his attributes. How many parents want to mold their children to their own will? How many parents want to live through their children? How many parents want their children to be a doctor, a lawyer, or the president? Do they grow them up and want them to be drug addicts and thieves and criminals? Is that the intent? <laughs> then why would God be any different? 
Does he want us to grow up to be like him? So he sent his son as an example. And we ended up killing him because we want the preacher's character. And again, we go back to the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt, which represents coming out of the world. What did they prefer to worship? Whose character? Pharaoh's. How do we know that? Golden calf. They built a golden calf. Gold representing character, the calf representing the government of Egypt. Correct? Who was the god in Egypt? Who is this? Pharaoh. Pharaoh. He, he was God. Who is this God that I should worship him? Isn't that what he said? I'm God. You worship me. Watch what I'm going to do to hurt you. So the people, they want to come out of Egypt, okay? However, they don't want to shed the character of Egypt. And Aaron, the high priest, did what? He blended them both together. Do we see that today? Do we see that today? More so than in his day. It was isolated at that point. Now it's rampant. <clears throat> God wants us to, he wants to impart to us his attributes. That's why, folks, the crowning glory of God's creation is man. Because Jesus himself, his own son, stands right now in flesh and blood. Is there any higher attainment? And look what we've done with that gift. We killed him. Mercilessly, by the way. Enabling him to exercise mercy and compassion. He wants to give us his mercy and compassion, but we have to accept the contract first, don't we? She goes on to say, God's covenant assures us of his unchangeable character. Why then are those who claim to believe in God changeable, fickle, unworthy? Why do they not do service heartily as under obligation to please and glorify God? It is not enough for us to have a general idea of God's requirements. We must know for ourselves what his requirements and obligations are. Now there it becomes very personal. When Jesus died, he got thrown in a common grave, didn't he? Is that right? He went in an unused sepulcher that belonged to another man. But that man was having that made for himself. Correct? Correct? Did it become very personal to Joseph of Marimathea when he saw his Savior laying in his intended grave? Do you think he got the point? Why can't we see Jesus laying in our grave? Why can't we see Jesus in the lake of fire for us? Did he suffer that? Eternal separation from the Father? Yes, he did. So that we don't have to. Provided we do what? Keep the conditions of the covenant, of the contract, of the deal. Jesus said, if you love me, you're going to go out and sin so I can die for you. And I'll have a purpose to my life. That's what they want you to believe. Does it make sense? Does that make sense, folks? Absolutely not. I'm going to die so that my father who doesn't change, I'm going to force him to change. Because then if he wants me in heaven with him, he's going to have to make change. Does that make sense? Is there anywhere as recorded in the scripture from Genesis to Revelation that Jesus was ever outside the will of his father? But yet, but yet, he's going to go and die a brutal death to do so. <laughs> Does that make sense? Just in plain old logic. Yeah, but. Yeah, but. Isn't that what you hear? Yeah, but. Yeah, but. This is a fact. I don't know about your buts. This is a fact. I didn't say that to be funny. Anyhow, she goes on to say, the terms of God's covenant are 
Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. These are the conditions of life. Do so, Christ said, and thou shalt live. That's what Jesus said. Isn't that what he said when they asked him to sum up the law? Absolutely. Christ's death and resurrection completed his covenant before this time. It was revealed through types and shadows which pointed to the great offering to be made by the world's Redeemer. Now we all know what's being referred to, the sacrificial system. Everything had great significance. We know that. Everything was very symbolic. <coughs> Sim the symbology, though, called the person's mind to where? To Christ's sacrifice. To the shedding of the blood, the payment for the covenant. You see? Once and for all, Paul says, he shed his blood. Offered in promise for the sins of the world. Anciently, believers were saved by the same Savior as now. <clears throat> but it was a veiled, uh, but it was a God veiled. Did you hear what she just said? Anciently, in other words, before the crucifixion, people were saved the same way they are now. However, God was veiled. Why? Because they asked for it. Remember when Moses was at Mount Sinai and Jesus and God came down to give them their law? What did they ask for? <coughs> oh no, oh no, we want it from Aaron. I'm paraphrasing. God was then veiled. Moses went into God's presence. Now when Moses came down from Sinai, was his, well he went into Jesus' presence, was his light shining? Oh yeah. But what did they tell him to do? Put a veil. Because the, it's too bright. The brightness, the light, represented the sin of or contrasted the sin of the people. They couldn't stand to look at it. <coughs> so today, what they've done is they haven't just veiled it. They threw it out. The law has been changed. Jesus died. I don't read that. Do you? Can you show me anywhere in here that it says that? Oh, the ceremonial law was definitely nailed to the cross. Ceremonial law being sacrifice this, sacrifice that, eat this, eat that, wear this, wear that. Go here on a certain day, go there. Doesn't mean the Sabbath was thrown out. But in the ceremonial law, they had many Sabbaths, didn't they? You can name a few of them right off your head. Uh, top of your head, Pentecost, uh, Passover, uh, uh, the, 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 the Feast of Tabernacles, etc., etc. They were all Sabbaths, holy weeks, holy days. That was all done away with because they all called to the coming of Jesus. Why would you continue to celebrate those things when the event that was calling to came? Would you keep selling tickets to a concert after the concert went? I'm sure you'd find people to buy them today, but anyhow. After the show came, are you going to go buy tickets for it? Well, that's the same thing. So that law was nailed to the cross. However, the character, the Ten Commandments, was resurrected in God's people, you see. The covenant was set in blood. You do these things, and you'll have eternal life. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a hoax. Because hundreds of thousands of people witnessed what took place 2,000 years ago at the crucifixion. The Pharisees went to great pains to cover it up. Just about every nation that was on earth was in Jerusalem. Why? Why? Because the Passover was coming up and people from all over the world were coming to Jerusalem to keep it. And when it happened, guess what they did? They wrote it down. One of the best documented events in history to ever take place was the crucifixion of Christ. <coughs> and you know what's amazing? All the newspapers concur. <laughs> what happened? Remember what the two disciples said to Jesus? Are you a stranger here? When they were walking back, to, don't you know what just happened? How can you not know what just happened? Why were they, was it done under a bushel? Everybody knew what happened. And the Romans, where they crucified him, when they found the crucifixion site, it was a well-traveled road that went into Rome. 
It was a very well-traveled road. Everybody walking by coming for that uh, to Jerusalem. Everybody, uh, 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 the, the road that went into Jerusalem, uh, it was one of the major highways, if you will. Everybody that walked by saw it. And there was a big commotion there because were the Jews humble? Were they upset? Or were they making fun, casting insults, singling him out? So they stopped. It was a sideshow, folks. That's what they turned it into. When you're walking down the street and you see a street vendor, you stop, or, or, or performer, you stop and look for a minute, don't you? No matter how big the crowd is, that's what was going on. So they all journaled what went on. There were writers there. There were preachers there. There were scholars there. It was no accident. And the road that Jesus was crucified on was buried because uh, when they went to besiege Jerusalem, when they built their besiegement walls, they filled in places with rocks, whatever they could get. Well, they found that crucifixion site was buried. It was under, way down. When they actually unearthed it, it wasn't up on a hill like you see on these wonderful Easter programs. And Jesus' cross was lower than the other two. Do you know why? That only goes with Roman, uh, uh, the way they did things. The worst of the offender was down lower than the others. If you were a thief, you were here. If you were a thief, you were here. But if you were a murderer, you were lower. It makes sense, right? You were the worst of the criminals. His was the lowest sight. It wasn't the highest. It wasn't the highest. That's, that's, that, that's not true. So, <clears throat> he didn't suffer all that, folks, so that we can break the contract. Go out and live the way the devil wants us to live, and then when we see Jesus, say, oh, I'm going. Or when I die. Yeah, I'm up there. Have you ever heard a preacher preach anybody into hell? Or they always preach them into heaven. Guy shooting heroin gets shot in the head because he just ripped the bank off, and then the Sunday service, though, he's in heaven now. Oh, really? Oh, really? Does that hold with the Bible? They never preach him into hell. They always preach him into heaven. I'm glad God doesn't do things that way. He keeps a record of what we do. He gives us the righteousness. He gives us the Holy Spirit. We have to surrender and submit. He does the rest. You see, that's the ministration of the gospel, folks. Oh, it is totally out of step with the world. And all the things we call fun, when we come to Jesus, the light shines on them. And this, again, is the menorah, and we're going to talk about that, I don't know, next time I'm up here. But <clears throat> those things then become dark, and we have to put them aside. But do we have to do it ourselves? No. He gives us the strength to overcome, because he's already been there. You see, we just have to believe it. Well, folks, we're out of time. Let's have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for Jesus. We thank you for your contract. And Father, may each one of us choose to sign on. But Father, the pen we dip the ink in, the ink is your son's blood that we sign that contract with. And may we accept that and get out of here, Father, and warn this world of what's coming. Everything happens for a purpose, Lord, and either we're going to be part of the problem or part of the solution, Father. May we all choose to be part of the solution. Thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' holy name we ask. Amen. <laughs>